I'm going to now recognize uh, Senator Heinrich for his questions. Thank you, Chair Baldwin. Um, Commissioner Califf, outside of acutely contaminated drinking water sources, uh, people are most exposed to PFAS chemicals through the food that they eat. Uh, food can become contaminated when it's grown or what we've seen in New Mexico where animals drink PFAS-laden water uh, as well as through food packaging. And in several parts of the country, PFAS contamination has manifested in agriculture posing a food safety risk. What is the FDA doing to regulate PFAS chemicals in our agricultural products? And does your agency have the resources it needs to successfully pursue that work? Thank you for, uh, so used to microphones to come on automatically. Thank you for um, <coughs> raising this issue. And to me, it exemplifies a whole host of similar issues that we have with contaminants uh, that are there to some level. Uh, the epidemiology of this is very complicated, and it takes a lot of science to figure out where to draw the line and where to intervene in these industries that are so critical to all of our welfare. So I'll ask Dr. Main to give us some of the details of what we're doing on this. Thank you, Senator. So PFAS is a very important priority for us, and not just to, at the FDA, but across the interagency. And we are working in partnership with all the different key in, uh, interagency partners, including EPA. Um, in terms of our role, um, we have multiple roles with regard to PFAS. The first one is just understanding what the dietary exposure is. We need to understand, you know, what is the hazard and what is the exposure. So we've been conducting analyses of the U.S. food supply through what's called our total diet study. In that testing, we've tested over 500 different samples. We found 10 that had detectable levels of PFAS in the general food supply. So very reassuring information with regard to the general food supply. However, of those 10 samples, eight of them that were detectable were seafood samples. And that has led us to being, do, doing additional analyses on PFAS and potential contamination uh, in seafood. We released some data very recently on that. So that is a key part of our work. The second part of it is when there are instances of local environmental contamination, as has occurred in your state, we work very closely with our state partners. And so we provide technical assistance. We have done analyses of samples for state partners because our analytical labs are, are, are capable of doing that. We have done that for New Mexico. And then we provide advice on what to do. This is a challenging problem. We are working with USDA, especially in, in the case of PFAS exposures and EPA, so it's an important priority. The last piece is the food contact use. There are certain authorized food contact uses of PFAS. If we have a concern about safety, we take steps. Are you largely talking about packaging in that yes. case? Yeah. Yes, I'm talking about food packaging. Thank you. And so there are certain authorized uses for food contact. If we have a concern about safety, we would withdraw those authorizations. And that has happened previously. We've had a market withdrawal recently for some short chain PFAS that we had some lack of confidence in the safety of those compounds. So those are the roles we are taking in PFAS. PFAS. With your, regard to your question about resources, we have uh, absorbed this work in our base budget, but we have requested new resources in the FY23 budget, and we'd be very grateful for support to increase our work in PFAS. Uh, you mentioned the prevalence of, of seafood within the samples that, that did test positive. Do you understand the, the mechanism or the vector there? Yeah, we're just early in the days of getting uh, information about seafood contamination with PFAS. What we did was a targeted sampling assignment of 81 different uh, seafood samples. Um, we looked at the most commonly consumed seafood in the U.S., things like tilapia and shrimp and salmon, uh, clams, uh, for example. Um, our results were released. We'd be happy to share them with you. What we did see were some very concerning levels in one particular commodity, and that was canned clams coming in from China. So that is new data that we have. Your question about mechanism of action, we suspect this is due to environmental contamination where those clams are coming from. Gotcha. But we are working with the companies to try to understand that better and prevent those types of exposures. Uh, Dr. Califf, before my time's expired, obviously it's super hypercritical that families can trust infant formula um, to be safe. And I know you've put a lot of effort into bringing offshore formula products up to our standards. But here in the U.S., I've heard complaints of long wait times for review, uh, for responses, for small domestic manufacturers. So what's the FDA doing to make sure its scarce resources prioritize those domestic American manufacturers and producers? I, I mean, as you know, we're 
working 24 by 7 on this to make sure that we have adequate supply and there is priority given to large quantity suppliers while we're in shortage, but we're, we're not going to slight U.S. producers. I might ask Dr. Main to also comment that she's running the, um, the diligent work of review. With regard to the immediate action to try to get more formula on shelves, one of our criteria for moving forward with enforcement discretion was available product and quantity of available product, because our goal, as directed by the administration, is to get formula on shelves as quickly as possible. At the same time, one of the things that we really want to do is make sure that we have a diverse infant formula manufacturing base going forward in time. There's a really important role here for U.S. manufacturers to play. So we, we want to encourage U.S. domestic manufacturers. Uh, we have some under review right now for enforcement discretion, but at the same time, we're also looking beyond the current shortage, and we would like to support them in terms of providing more diversity to infant formula manufacturing in this country for a more resilient supply. Uh, Madam Chair, can I make one more quick comment on this? Please, it's Dr. Califf, go it's ahead. Just, um, I, I, I heard your admonition about it's not all about money and resources, but I mean, this is an area where we know we had nine people working on this. Uh, you graciously added four people last year. Um, given the need, um, it, it's an area where just having enough people to do the work, we, you know, we've moved a lot of people over from other things to help make this happen now, but we can't sustain that without uh, specific funding. 